Okay, um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I, I enjoyed seeing the photo of the Kalank at the end of David's <laughs> talk. And here it's like lightly snowing in Toronto right now. So it'd be nice to, uh, to be there it's instead. It's, it's raining in Paris also. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so indeed, I'll speak about uh, Hamiltonian reduction for affine Grassmannian slices. And um, let's begin. Okay, so the main object of play in my talk will be these affine Grassmannian slices. So one way to think of them is that they're analogs of, of intersections of Schubert varieties and opposite Schubert varieties in flag varieties. So here is the definition. So we begin with a semi-simple group G, and we form its affine Grassmannian. We take the points of G over Laurent polynomials and divide out by the points over polynomials. So it's an infinite dimensional variety. For any uh, co weight mu of our group G, we have a point in the affine Grassmannian. These are precisely the fixed points for the torus action on the affine Grassmannian. And then if we have a dominant co weight, we can consider this um, spherical orbits. Sorry, I realize a small typo. That should be G and not G checked there. Anyway, this thing should be gone, that G check. Okay. So we consider the um, the G of O orbits, the polynomial orbits through a point T lambda, and these partition the affine Grassmannian, and they are finite dimensional varieties, and we consider their closures here inside the affine Grassmannian. It's the union over smaller Ger mu's. So the, the Ger lambda bar is a finite dimensional, usually singular projective variety, analog of a Schubert variety and a flag variety. Now we consider the opposite orbits. Sorry, these checks were there from an earlier version of the talk. They seem to have stayed some of them. We consider to form, we're going to consider opposite orbits, so slices. These are going to be finite co-dimensional. And to form them, we choose this complementary group to G over polynomials. We take G over polynomials and T inverse, but we look at the first congruent subgroup there. So, oops, sorry, this is also another typo. Ah, that's why I like ones you can write on. Anyway, so uh, we consider the first congruent subgroup in there. So the kernel of the evaluation map at t goes to infinity. So that defines us this semi, this, sorry, this infinite orbit, finite codimensional orbit W mu, which is uh, transverse to the Ger lambdas. And then we take the intersection of Ger lambda bar with W mu, and we obtain W lambda mu. So the bar on top indicates that we use the closure on Ger lambda bar, but not on W mu. So this W lambda mu is a slice to the to Ger, um, inside Ger lambda bar to the Ger mu orbit, okay? because this W mu is transverse to Ger mu. And finally, we'll also need one other piece of notation, um, so-called semi-infinite orbits. So here, rather than taking the full group G, we work just with the lower triangular part, the unipotent radical of a Borel, we'll call it N minus to okay, think of it as being lower triangular. And I take its points over Laurent polynomials and take its orbit. And I get something that's um, kind of half in its finite dimensional. It's neither finite dimensional nor finite co-dimensional. Okay, and here's one example, a very basic example that I think is good, good to keep in mind if you haven't seen these W lambda mu's before. If I take G to be SLN and I take a very special lambda, so which is just N times the first fundamental weight, co weight, and I take mu to be zero, so very special choice of lambda mu. In this case, W lambda mu is the full nilpotent cone inside of SLN. In fact, um, other type A nilpotent orbit closures also arise as W lambda mu. And in fact, um, any uh, any intersection of a nilpotent orbit closure with a slow-to-way slice in type A arises as a W lambda mu. But this is a kind of a type A specific phenomenon. These nilpotent cones are not as easily related or not so directly related. There's some relation, but not a very strong relation to the affine Grassmannian slices outside of type A. Okay, so if you haven't seen these affine Grassmannian slices before, thinking about these nilpotent cones is a good um, first approximation. Okay, so this affine Grassmannian slice has been a big study in the past uh, 10, 10 years or so. 
And we have now a quite, quite a body of results about FN gross money and slices. So let me explain some of our work on them. Okay, so the following results are sort of a combination of various papers and essentially, I guess, due to most of them are due to either Robert Finkelberg and Nikojima or um, myself with Webster, Weeks, and Kobe, or maybe some slight combinations of different groups. We'll, we'll come to some other specific, more specific theorems a little later. So this is a more general kind of theorem. Okay, the first thing is that they have a structure, one of these affine gross money slices has a structure of an affine Poisson variety. So it's it's an affine variety basically because W mu is a sort of infinite dimensional affine, uh, affine variety, and then we cut it by something close, so we get an affine variety. And it's as a Poisson structure, comes from the a Manin triple involving the Lie algebra of the loop group. So I won't get into the Poisson the definition there, but there is a very nice Poisson structure. This Poisson structure has what's called symplectic singularities. It's a technical condition, but in particular it means that there's only finally many symplectic leaves. And in fact, these symplectic leaves are nothing but those W nu mu's, where, where nu lies between mu and lambda. Those are the um, symplectic leaves of W lambda mu bar. So if I don't put the bar, by the way, it means instead of intersecting with ger lambda bar, I intersect with ger lambda, or in this case with ger nu. I have a torus action on my affine Grossmannian, which just comes from the torus inside of G. And I mentioned before that this action, um, the fixed points of this action in affine Grossmannian are those special points T mu's labeled by the coates of G. And the fixed points in it, this action only has a single fixed point inside the affine Grossmannian slice, W lambda mu, namely T mu. And the attracting set for that action is this. Uh, intersection girl lambda bar with the semi-infinite orbit. And because of the this action is a Hamiltonian action, this attracting locus is, ends up being a Lagrangian subvariety of, of W lambda mu. So this um, intersection of girl lambda bar with S mu is a, a sort of, I guess, of interest going back to the work of Mirkovich and Velonen from almost 20 years ago. So the irreducible components of that intersection are called mirkovich velonen cycles. And one, um, some sense, like motivation or something for these affine Grossmannian slices, it's a way of making something of twice the dimension which contains that MV locus and uh, as a Lagrangian. So some, making something Poisson affine which contains the MV locus as a Lagrangian. Okay. Another general, another feature of these affine Grossmannian slices is that they carry an integrable system. So that means a map of Poisson commuting uh, functions, collection of Poisson commuting functions, which gives a map to an affine space of half the dimension. Um, and another uh, feature which has arose in recent years for these affine Grossmannian slices is that they're what's called Coulomb branches of a quiver gauge theory. So I'll get back to this much later in the talk, but it's definitely an important uh, feature of them. And okay, so now I'm to point five. So the affine Grossmannian slices carry, I mentioned they're a Poisson variety. So their coordinate rings are a Poisson algebra. So it makes sense to consider a quantizations. So non-commutative algebra, whose associated graded is isomorphic to this coordinate ring, and where it carries the, where the Poisson structure measures the first order non-commutativity of the algebra. And um, by work of Kaleid and Bezukovnikov and Losev, uh, any affine Poisson variety with symplectic singularities carries a quantization, has a quantization, in fact, a canonical family of quantizations. And in our case, for these affine Grossmannian slices, we can explicitly describe these quantizations, and they're algebras that we call truncated shifted Yangians. Um, in particular, in fact, um, the is here is a slight lie because there's not a single quantization, but a whole family of quantizations, and that family of quantizations is actually, a, well, different possible truncated shifted Yangians. Like with the, sorry, there's a parameter in the truncated shifted Yangian which relates to this quantization. Um, so I won't get into exact definition of truncated shifted Yangians in this talk. Um, I mean, they're closely related to this truncated shifted quantum affine algebras, which appeared in David Hernandez's talk earlier today. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, but maybe if you didn't see that talk, or you, then maybe the most important thing to keep in mind is that there are some very explicit algebras which we can describe by generators and relations. So we have some very um, explicit understanding of these quantizations. So um, next, some results, two, two results down here, number six. So the first result is, is essentially the, um, related to the theorem of Mirkovich and Willowenden. So it tells you that this, if we take the topology of this Gurlem de Bar intersect S mu, this MV locus, then under the geometric Satake correspondence, it's isomorphic to a weight space of a rep irreducible representation of the Langlands dual group. So I didn't write this down, but this V lambda guy here, that's the irreducible representation of the Langlands dual group of highest weight lambda, and the sub mu means the mu weight space there. And then the, I suppose this one maybe should have a check now that I think about it. Let's put a check over there. And, and then the uh, second result is that if instead of considering not just the, this, um, not just the MV locus, this attracting set, but we consider the pre-image of zero of this integral system map. Now, the, this girl lambda intersect S mu is contained in that zero level of the integral system map but the zero level of the is bigger and can have other, in general, other irreducible components. If we work with that guy instead, then we get a bigger, it, it sort of, the topology is a bigger space. Instead of just being the new weight space in V lambda, we should take V lambda and tensor with this um, C of N check. So it's like a dual Verma module, highest weight zero, if you like. Take that tensor product and then take the mu weight space in there. Okay, so it's, Bigger. Um, this second result doesn't really appear anywhere explicitly in the literature, but um, um, well, Misha Finkelberg indicated to me the proof of this result once. Okay, we continue. So, all this so far was the discussion for mu dominant. Okay, so lambda um, is dominant sort of because lambda is kind of related to this highest weights, the dual group. And it's also dominant because it's related to the, that's what parameterizes these G of O orbits in Affine Grassmannian. So it's natural to have lambda dominant, but mu, um, it's, it's nice to. For example, just sorry, going back one slide, this mu weight space here, of course, can be considered when mu is not dominant. And in fact, part six is sort of true even when mu is not dominant, but we need a home, we need to put this girl lambda bar intersect S mu inside something, inside some kind of W lambda mu, which is of twice the dimension, which is a Poisson variety. And it's not very obvious how to do that. Like there's a naive definition of what this W lambda mu is when mu is not dominant. You just use the old definition, but allow mu not to be dominant, but that doesn't work. You get something too small. So, but in recent years, um, starting, I guess, about five years ago in the work of Bullimore, de Moff de Gato, so in the physics literature, there came to be a definition of this W lambda mu when mu is not necessarily dominant. So first we begin by defining W mu. So rather than being a subvariety of that fingers money, it were simply a subvariety, um, type, it's just G, T, T, sorry. It's just um, W mu is simply defined to be a sub, variety of GTT inverse, so the full, the loop group, G over polynomial, Laurent polynomials. And how is it defined? Well, we look for those elements in there which have a kind of Gauss decomposition where the, the pieces, in the lower triangular and upper triangular parts of the Gauss decomposition are, are um, in T polynomials in T inverse with, um, with this first congruence condition. And then we shove mu into the into the diagonal part here. Okay, so that's the definition of W mu. It looks slightly um, maybe surprising definition, like maybe even not not very well motivated, um, but it turns out to be the right definition for a whole host of reasons, which I'll explain. And then from there we can define W lambda mu by simply taking the W mu with the GT double coset through T lambda, the closure of that, inside the loop group. And once again, um, yeah, sorry. Well, let me just continue. So if we take lambda to be zero, um, we can do that. 
And then this mu becomes now, well, I'll write it as negative nu. It becomes something in the dominant, um, in the negative root cone. Okay, I should have mentioned maybe that lambda minus mu to be non-empty means that for, for w lambda mu to be non-empty, it means that lambda minus mu is in the positive root cone. So in this case, now negative nu is in the negative root cone. So nu is in the positive root cone. And so if we take lambda to be zero, it's not very hard to show that this, this space here, w zero minus nu, is a space of base maps, sometimes called the open zast of a space. So base map from P1 into the flag variety of degree nu. So something people had been studying for a long time, for example, in quantum cohomology literature and other places. And if you take lambda not to be zero, then there's still a, a kind of modular interpretation of this W lambda mu, uh, which is given in the work of Braverman, Finkelberg, Nakajima. So, um, so that maybe is mm, and one another motivation for this definition of W lambda mu. So uh, the simplest case of this space of base maps, which I'll need later in the talk, so I'll mention it here, is when this nu is simply a single simple root. And in this case, we get just the cotangent bundle of C star. And as it's quantization, we get just the differential operators on C star. Okay, so these, um, I, I didn't write it before, but these guys, when mu is not dominant, we usually call them generalized affine Grassmannian slices. Okay, so if mu is not dominant, they're called generalized affine Grassmannian slices. And basically all the results I said before about affine Grassmannian slices go through to the case of generalized affine Grassmannian slices. And it's basically the work of the same people from before, maybe with some more recent papers of of, of Dinakar Muthaya together with Alex Weeks and, and Krilov, and also a very recent paper of, of Zhu, who's one of, one of the statements here. So the first point is that this guy, these generalized slices are still affine Poisson varieties with symplectic singularities before, and the symplectic leaves are what you think they are. I guess maybe, maybe there's a slight typo here. So this nu should be dominant and also be bigger than or equal to the, the, the like dominant translate of of mu here, anyway, doesn't matter that much. Anyway, so the symplectic leaves are, are what you expect, and, and this guy is um, an affine Poisson variety with symplectic singularities. The torus again acts and has a unique fixed point, and the same attracting locus, the same MV locus here, appears as the attracting locus, except this only it's true if, if V of lambda, if the mu weight space of this representation V lambda is non-zero. If it is zero, then this, this girl lambda bar intersect this mu is empty, and this fixed point doesn't lie inside W lambda. There's still an integrable system, and it's still the Coulomb branch of a quiver gauge theory. So it's another um, way you could have just defined it to be that Coulomb branch. And the quantization of this um, generalized Afrangus minus slice is still a uh, truncated shifted union. And it's no longer, um, but it's no longer a subquotient of the Yangian. So previously, oh, I didn't quite say this, but previously the truncated shifted Yangian, the, the name is like that because we have this thing called the shifted Yangian, which is a subalgebra of the Yangian, and then we truncate it, we take a quotient. And now if mu is not dominant, we still have an algebra called the shifted Yangian, but it's not a subalgebra of the Yangian. But still it behaves in very similar ways even when mu is not dominant. And we have the same two results um, here concerning the topomology of, again, the MV locus and then the zero level integrable system. And notice, for example, this zero level integrable system, this can make sense even um, when, the, when the MV locus is empty. For example, even if lambda is zero, so imagine that lambda is zero, so we, have, we would have here a zero, I mean, well, we would have here the zero, we would have here just C, one dimensional vector space if lambda is zero. So then we get this mu weight space. In that case, we would get this mu or maybe minus mu weight space of this um, Verma module. And the fact that the topomology of this zero level of the integrable system in this open Zastava space recovers the weight space in the Verma module. That's an old theorem of Finkelberg and Merkovich. 
So even when lambda is zero, this statement here is quite interesting. Okay. So we have this inter this integrable system that I've mentioned a few times. It can um, be quantized. So it well it corresponds to a map backwards from a polynomial ring into the coordinate ring of W lambda mu. And that can be quantized to a polynomial subalgebra of the quantization, y lambda mu, of the truncated shifted union. And this polynomial subalgebra, it's kind of the obvious polynomial subalgebra when you write the generators of the truncated shifted union. And in any case, we call it the Gelfand Settlin subalgebra. Well, it's maybe not completely obvious subalgebra. Anyway, it's a, it's a subalgebra there, a, a polynomial subalgebra. So one example, which um, is of interest, is I mentioned before, that if we take SLN and we take the very special lambda, which is n times the first fundamental weight, and we take mu to be zero, the corresponding affine Grassmannian slice was this uh, nilpotent cone. And it's obvious how to quantize the nilpotent cone. It's quantized by the universal enveloping algebra modulo uh, central character. So, and in fact, that is the quantization that you get as the truncated shifty union. So this truncated shifty union is the universal enveloping algebra by the central character. And of course, people have studied the gelfand setlin subalgebra of the universal enveloping algebra of SLN. I guess going back to Gelfin and Zetlin. And the way they did it was they, they formed this algebra by considering centers of all smaller USLKs, where K varies from 2 up to n minus 1, and and corresponds to the upper k by k block of this n by n matrix. So in our case, the gelfand settlin algebra we have by thinking about it as a truncated shifted union is the same as the Gelfin, classical gelfand settlin algebra. And that's why we call them gelfand settlin algebras in general. OK, so we'll be interested in two categories of modules for truncated shifted unions. One is what we call GT modules. And the other is the category O modules. Okay, so the GT modules means the category where the, this gelfand settlin subalgebra acts locally finitely. And there's a subalgebra O, which is the sub kind of corresponds to the classical kind of category O, and that's where we impose the additional condition that the weights for this um, gelfand settlin algebra or the eigenvalues for the skeleton cell and algebra are kind of bounded above in a certain way. Um, the reason to consider these two categories of modules, one motivation, is that there, if we take a module like that, we can, well, we can consider it singular support, which will be a sub-variety of the affine Grassmannian slice. If we have a gelfand settlin module, um, one of these if we have a module in this category of GT modules for the YM de mu, then it, its um, singular support, um, or maybe I should just call it support, anyway, let's say it's support, will lie inside the, the zero level of the integrable system. If, on the other hand, if it's, in, if it's a category O module, its support will lie in this upper triangle, this attracting locus. And I'll remind you that these two loci, the attracting locus and the um, zero level of the integral system, are of interest because they're, they're sort of um, giving us incarnations of interesting representations. So the mu weight space in V lambda or the mu weight space in this tensor product of V lambda with this Fermi module. So we can hope to use these categories of modules of GT modules or category O modules for the purpose of categorification, for the purpose of categorifying those uh, representations of the Langlands dual group. Now, to be like even more precise, there'll be a map from the Grothendieck group of these categories here to the, those corresponding homologies. So it's natural to study these categories modules. Okay. So the theorem we proved, um, together with, with Tingley, Webster, Weeks, and Jacobi, describes these categories of modules using um, KL, KLRW algebras, Kovanov, Lauder, Ruki, Webster algebras. So this is the algebras um, which were introduced for the purpose of categorification. And there are some 
explicit combinatorial diagrammatic algebras, which I won't get into their definitions. Um, for the those who've seen it before, so it, the reason why I call it a put the W here, Webster, is because we have, I mean, the version of Ben Webster where we have these red strands and the black strands. And then I have two versions of this algebra, T lambda mu and this minus uh, T lambda mu. So the minus is the quotient by those diagrams where um, the leftmost strand is red. Leftmost strand is black, sorry. Which is kind of closely related to cyclic, gen, this generalizes the notion of cyclotomic quotients of KLR algebras. Okay, so our theorem uh, just says that the category, well, respectively, the category of GT modules for Y lambda mu and the category O for Y lambda mu are described by these equivalent to these modules for the KLRW algebras. Um, this theorem is a slight, uh, this is a slight um, simplification of the actual statement of the theorem because I've suppressed the roles of the parameters. So the truncated shifted yang depends on some parameters, which it should because there's a um, quantization parameters when you do this kind of quantization. And these parameters then in turn affect the KLRW algebra. So we actually needed to invent some new versions of KLRW algebras, which, which are called metric KLRW algebras, which depend on these parameters in order to, well, to even state this theorem and prove it. Okay, so there's actually some, like way more notation that I've suppressed here that's going on related to these parameters. Okay, let me explain some corollaries now of this theorem. So this theorem, um, it's like, this is the, still the introduction to the main thing I wanna talk about today. But this theorem was um, uh, from maybe two, two years ago, I suppose. One corollary of this theorem, which was unexpected corollary for us, <laughs> is that you can use this theorem to actually compute the number of simple Gelfand-Setland modules for the universal developing algebra of SLN. So it's just a completely classical question. You take SLN, you study those simple modules on which the Gelfand-Setland subalgebra acts locally finitely. So this is a problem people had actually been studying for, for 20 years. It was mentioned by, it was the subject of Futurni's ICM address uh, just in 2018, and it was an open problem, and it's solved by, by our theorem because we have this equivalence of categories, and it's quite easy to count the number of simple KLRW algebra modules because we know exactly what it categorifies for the KLRW algebra. Okay, now a second sort of corollary, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today, is that I mentioned before that one motivation for studying these categories of modules for the truncated shifted Yangians was for the purpose of categorification. So we'd like their growth in the groups, we know are isomorphic to this, or sorry, we know their growth in the groups map to the homology of this MV locus or this zero level integral system. And we know those homologies are isomorphic to weight spaces of representations of the Langhans dual group. So we'd like to use these categories of modules to categorify representations of the Langhans dual group. And we can do this using the theorem. So using this transport de structure, we know that the KLRW algebras, um, there is a functors between modules for them, which give you the categorification. So therefore we get such functors uh, on the side of the truncated shifted Yangian modules. So for example, we can get some statement like this for each simple root, we have a functor and it, it changes the mu, which it should, because mu is like representing the weight space, what weight space you're in. So it goes from y lambda mu GT modules to y lambda mu plus alpha i GT modules, and together it categorifies, uh, I guess it should be a check here, this representation. So if we collect together overall mu, and this thing, but uh, you know, as a representation of, 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 not of the full G, but of just of the upper triangular, sorry, not of the full G check, but just of, just of N check. If you wanted to categorify for the full Langlands dual the algebra, you could do that, but you would have to, um, I mean, you could do that, but not with these GT modules, but just with the category O. So on category O, you'll have functors going in both directions and they'll be adjoint to each other, get categorifying B lambda. But if you work with this, um, just this gelfand Selin modules, you only get categorification of half. Anyway, for the purpose I'm talking today, it doesn't, the distinction isn't that important. Okay, so here's the question I'd like to discuss today. This functors, again, were obtained by 
uh, first applying the equivalence and using the functor on that side. So is there a way to obtain such functors directly by thinking about truncated shifted Yangians or by thinking about Coulomb branches um, without applying this equivalence? And on a sort of related note is exactly how is this functor is related to the geometric Satake correspondence? The geometric Satake correspondence is in the background because that was showing us why this top homologies were giving us weight spaces of the representations of the dual group. So this is the question I'd like to talk about today. Can we construct such functors without using the equivalents? Okay. So in order to, uh, const to, to construct such functors, we need to relate two truncated shifted Yangians, y lambda mu and y lambda mu plus alpha i. So there we've changed the mu by alpha i. And we have um, sort of one tool that we can use, which is there's for Affengrass money and slices, um, there are these multiplication maps. So they're basically defined using multiplication in the loop group followed by a kind of projection. And they can be quantized to certain co multiplication maps and go in the opposite direction between the quantizations. These co multiplication maps were introduced um, by joint work with Finkelberg. FM, Rivnikov, and Weeks. Okay. Another uh, maybe tool we're going to use is a certain action of the additive group on W mu. And it's just, again, defined by a kind of multiplication. So I multiply A here as a complex number. Xi of A denotes the root subgroup of G corresponding to the simple root alpha I. So like a matrix which is upper triangular with a just entry in the i, i plus one entry, if we we're in the slime case. And so this action is, it turns out this is a Hamiltonian action on W mu with respect to its Poisson structure, and it has a moment map, which I'll call phi i. Okay, so together, these two are the ingredients for the theorem which is coming up, which is going to relate these f minus slices or truncated shifted Yangians where we change by alpha i. So here's the theorem. So if we restrict this multiplication map uh, to this particular case, so I, I've, multiplication is just defined in, in, as I said, in a great generality, kind of mu1 and mu2, but here I, I take mu plus alpha I and minus alpha I. So when I multiply two guys in those slices, I land in the mu slice. And um, not only did I land in the mu slice, in fact, it's, we can prove that we land in the phi I inverse of C star. So I have this moment map, and so then I have the locus where this uh, moment map doesn't vanish, and that's where my multiplication lands. And when I restrict the to the zero here and, and put a lambda up here, then this map's actually an isomorphism. And I'll remind you that this W zero minus alpha I is an extremely simple guy. It's just a cotangent bundle of C star. And from part one, you can immediately deduce that this means we have a, an isomorphism between the Hamiltonian reduction of W lambda mu by GA at MO map one. So I take the preimage of one on the MO map and divide by GA with W lambda mu plus alpha I. So two follows as a immediate crawler of one. Now, let me explain why two is kind of a reasonable statement you might expect. So first of all, let's just note that the dimension is right, <laughs> because the dimension of these varieties W lambda mu, I didn't mention it before, maybe I s it was implicit before, but I didn't mention it explicitly, is given by the pairing between two rho and lambda minus mu. So since when we go up by alpha i, the pairing, of course, with alpha i with two rho is two, so dimension is dropped by two. So dimension is looks good. Another reason why that it's reasonable to look for this kind of Hamiltonian reduction by action of additive group is because in the case, uh, um, I mentioned there's a relation between this affine Grossmannian slices and Slodoway slices. And there's a result of Gann and Ginsberg about obtaining Slodoway slices using Hamiltonian reduction by actions of unipotent groups. So it's natural to look for this kind of relation here between affine Grossmannian slices, neighbor, like ones where the dimension will drop by two, we'll just need an action of GA. Okay. And now there's a um, um, quantization version of one, which I stated as part three, so, so that there's, you can use co-multiplication 
to give you an isomorphism between the quantization of the right-hand side here. So quantization of this side means we should invert some function. So I write phi i to also denote the um, corresponding element of the truncated shift Dianian to corresponding to phi i. It's a slight abuse of notation. Really, it's better to call it e i upper one or something. So I invert that guy in, in y lambda mu, and I get such a nice morphism with the tensor product, which quantizes the left-hand side uh, uh, in, in, in above in one. Now, this number three, um, uh, in our paper, we actually proved a slightly weaker version of this number three. So um, it's true exactly as stated for SLN, but outside of SLN, uh, we have a slightly weaker statement, which is like way too complicated to explain in what way it's weaker. But um, anyway, it's, it's not quite true number three as I've written here. So there's one um, like unfortunate thing about this theorem. So our theorem, we wanted we wanted to use this to to construct a functor to relate y lambda mu modules to y lambda mu plus alpha i modules, and we wanted it to Sorry, relate. Joel. There is a question from uh, in the chat for you. Oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alan asked two questions. Oh, uh, the first uh, a long time ago. The like, <laughs> two quantize a known bimodule. Oh, um, yes. So, so I, I guess, yeah. So three here was a was a quantization of was a statement about was a kind of quantization of one. So I guess Alan's asking me if if the quantization of two is also true. And yes, just like two follows from one, there's like a statement which follows from three. And the bimodule is something like um, y lambda mu um, y lambda mu mod um, modulo the left ideal generated by phi i minus one. It's, it's a kind of quantum Hamiltonian reduction statement. Okay. Um, anyway, I was um, so that that's fine. You can use a bimodule. It does give you a bimodule, and that bimodule can be used to define a functor between modules, but it doesn't preserve the. Um, it doesn't seem to be the, the functor we wanted <laughs> because it doesn't take modules which are this locally finite for the gelfand settling algebra to ones which are locally finite for the gelfand settling algebra. And most of the, the the I don't know difficulty is because this. This co-multiplication map is sort of in a, behaves in a complicated way on this um, gelfand settling subalgebra, or equivalently, the isomorphism in one does not preserve the integrable system. Now, now after uh, D David's talk this morning, I was thinking maybe we could use, maybe maybe we can modify it using this Drinfeld co-product idea. So maybe there's still some hope. But anyway, the way we have it. Now we don't seem to give a functor, which our desired functor. But now having explained that, I'm going to explain a different way which we can actually produce our desired functor. So for this other way, I'll need to talk a little bit, a little detour into the world of Coulomb branches, which I think is uh, you know, of interest for its own sake. So now I introduce another, a new group G. So um, I apologize, the letter G is the only one we can use for groups, so I have to use it twice in this time. And so this is a new G. The other G is now, from now on, will be called GQ, G sub Q, when it reoccurs, okay? So now G is a new group, and actually it's, it's usually going to be a reductive group, not, not a semi-symbol group. In fact, usually it'll be a product of GLNs. Okay? So given a group G and a representation, the physicists can define a gauge theory, and from this gauge theory, they produce two different spaces. The first space they call the Higgs branch, which is defined to be the Hamiltonian reduction of the cotangent bundle of G, sorry, the cotangent bundle of V by the action of G. And when I say two spaces, I mean like for them, like two hypercalar spaces, or for us, like two um, Poisson varieties. And the second, which is called the Coulomb branch, and its mathematical definition is much more complicated. But it was defined about five years ago in the work of Robert Finkelberg and Nakajima. And here's the definition is quite complicated, but I've, I've uh, 
condensed it all to one line at the risk of making it unintelligible, but let me try. So we take V and G and we form its stack quotient, the stack quotient of V by G. Then we consider this thingy, the union of two copies of the puncture of the disk over the punctured disk. So it's a non-separated curve with a doubled origin. So we take the D here is just a formal disk. So we take a formal disk with a doubled origin. Two copies of the formal disk glued along the punctured disk. And we consider maps from that non-separated curve into the stack V minus G. So explicitly that's the space of principal G bundles on this curve, along with the section of V on the two halves, the associated bundle to V on, on, the, on, the, on the thing. So in other words, it's two G bundles on the formal disk, um, which are identified uh, away from the origin and have a compatible section of the associated bundle. So that's that space. It's actually closely related to the Affangers mining of the group G. Like if, if V was, if the representation V is trivial, then this space of maps is just the quotient of the Affangers mining by the action of the loop group. Uh, sorry, action of the base loop group, positive loops. And then we take, so then we get some interesting stack, then we take its homology, and the homology of the stack carries a convolution algebra structure, analogous to the convolution algebra structure on the homology of the Steinberg variety. And then it turns out that this algebra is not is commutative, and then so we can take spec of it, and that's the Coulomb prime. So it's quite a, a involved definition, but it turns out to be something you can really work with, and do computations with, and um, have a lot of fun. Another good feature about it, which can be seen from this definition, is that there's a way to produce a quantization of the Coulomb branch. Well, it's from this viewpoint, it's pretty straightforward. All we do is we consider an action of C star on this space of maps, where C star acts on this punctured disk, uh, or disk in the obvious way. And then we take uh, equivariant homology with respect to that C star action. And that gives us actually now a non-commutative algebra. So instead of taking spec of it, we just take that non-commutative algebra and it's the quantization. So when you when you when you kill the non when you kill the C star covariant parameter, it gives you back the original coordinate. So this is the definition of Coulomb branch. So defined for any group and any representation. So as I mentioned, we're not going to use the original kind of group we started with, but that group is now called GQ. And we take lambda and mu as before. And we do what we would do if we were building a Nakajima Kuba variety. So we start with some framed vertices. We take our Dinkin diagram and we um, choose an orientation. And we put VI dimensional subspaces along that Dinkin diagram. And we put framing, ver framing vector space of dimensions WI, where VIs and WIs come from lambda and mu in the way that I wrote, which is the usual way when you're forming an Nakajima quiver, right? And that's our V, okay? <clears throat> so the Higgs branch, oh, and our group G is a product of GLs of this gauge vertices, GLVIs. So all these products here are over the Dickin diagram of the group G, and the sum here is over the Dickin diagram of G, and the sum here is over the edges in the Dickin diagram of G. Um, sorry, in the thinking of GQ. I call it GQ because I think Q is being the this quiver or thinking diagram, and GQ is the group associated thinking diagram. So the Higgs branch, if we just take the take the cotangent bundle and take the Hamiltonian reduction by G, that would like have the effect of doubling all the edges. That's what taking the cotangent bundle does. And then we take the Hamiltonian reduction by G and we get the Nakajima quiver variety. So it's not what we're doing here. We're doing this like more wild Coulomb branch construction. And when we do this Coulomb branch construction, it spits out um, W lambda mu, surprisingly. Um, and then, um, and also, it also spits out the truncated shifted Yangian. So, <clears throat> so this appears in the work of well, these, all these people who I mentioned before, plus uh, Codera is also involved. I should mention, um, um, there's a version of this implicitly, this slide, I've sort of assumed that GQ was simply laced. There's a version of this where G is not necessarily simply laced. 
there's a refinement of the construction of Coulomb branch due to Nakajima and Weeks, and then the an analog of this theorem is true in that case. So even if it's not simple, there's something you can do. Okay. So, so the upshot of this, this discussion about Coulomb branches is it's a way of producing the affine gross Meinian slices. And it looks like sort of very complicated, but it actually is a very powerful technique for studying <coughs> um, affine gross Meinian slices and this truncated shifted Yangians. In fact, this Coulomb branch perspective was used um, to prove the theorem in the first half of the talk relating affine gross Meinian slices and KLRW algebras, and it's actually a special case sort of, of other work of Webster, which generally studies um, symplectic duality for Coulomb branches. Okay, so what are we going to do now about this? So, so let's go, we're, let's return to the generality of Coulomb branches. So I have a reductive group and a representation. I get a Coulomb branch by this complicated method. And I choose one more piece of data, which will be a co-weight of my group G. So I call it C. And I can form the Levy subgroup, which is the centralizer of the image of C. So for example, if G was GLN, then this C will break this GLN into a product of, of you know, smaller block diagonal matrices, smaller GLs along the diagonal. So that's that product of GLs is this L C. And the, so that's um, the other thing I can do is I can also take my representation V and consider the vectors invariant under the action of this C. So C gives me action of C star on V, and I take vectors invariant for the C star. Nothing will be a representation of L C. So I've made my group smaller, and I've made my representation smaller. And I would like to lay these two Coulomb branches, or these two quantized Coulomb branches, Coulomb branch algebras. And the theorem we're proving, so this is a, this paper, I should have mentioned that the previous theorem I said about Hamiltonian reduction between F and Grassmannian slices um, was posted to the archive this year, a few months ago. And this latest theorem I'm about to explain is um, still work in progress, but it's all, almost finished. Okay. So we've constructed a functor between category of Galf and Zetlin modules for AGV and category of Galf and Zetlin modules for this other algebra, ALXIVXC. And it's a kind of Hamiltonian reduction. It's sort of inspired by the kind of Hamiltonian reduction I was thinking, talking about earlier, but it's more complicated. I can't really explain it in, two, in, in, in a short period of time, but it, it involves first, first applying a Morita equivalence and then, and then considering a map of algebra. So, okay. so it's related to, the, it's in the same flavor as what I talked about before, but more complicated. And, and this sort of additional complication kind of is used to get rid of the problem involving the Cartan. So I mentioned before that the reason why, or involving the Galfin Sun algebra, the reason why the other thing wasn't good, the other Hamilton induction wasn't good, is because um, the Galfin Sun algebra sort of wasn't mapped to the Galfin Sun algebra. But when we do this more complicated thing, it solves that problem. So we're going to apply that to our um, Afrangers Manian slices and their quantizations. So the way we're going to do that is we choose G and V as above so that the Coulomb branch is W lambda mu. So remember, G is a product of GLs, one for each vertex in the Dinkin diagram. And V is that hom between all those vector spaces and the framings, like you would have if you were making an Nakajima curve right. And so now I'm free to pick C. And the way I pick it is to use the first fundamental co-weight of the ith copy of GL. So I have a fixed i in mind, fixed vertex in my Dinkin diagram, and I map C star into that GL and into that, so it's, so it's the first fundamental co-weight. So it's mapping into the top left corner of that general linear group. And so it splits that general linear group as a product of just C star for that top left corner and the rest of the matrix. So, so a kind of block diagonal matrix, but one block is almost all the matrix. Okay, so this is this black diagonal matrix, black diagonal matrices here. So that's my levy. And then it turns out that if you think about what VC does, it sort of gets rid of the arrows um, in your quiver, which kind of pass through that, well, it splits that, it splits that ith vector space in the quiver into 
two vector spaces, one of dimension one and one of the rest of them, and it kind of gets rid of the arrows through that other piece, and it has the effect that the Coulomb branch becomes the affine Grassmannian slice where you've increased mu by alpha i. So increasing mu by alpha i decreases the dimension at the ith vertex by i, cross a factor which is unimportant and comes from this c star. So if, remember if we have the group c star and trivial representation, then we get the Coulomb branch w0 minus alpha i, which is isomorphic to the cotangent bundle of c star. So this is an uninteresting factor which fits this which gets splits up, split off, and then we have the interesting factor here. So this is great for us because um, um, this is like exactly where we want to be because this quantizes to our y lambda mu plus alpha i. So doing this, um, so as a special case of this um, functor here, which goes between any gv and any lc vxi, so as a special case of that, we get a functor down this left vertical functor here, going between gelfand settlin modules for y lambda mu and gelfand settlin modules for y lambda mu plus alpha i. And, and the horizontal bars here are the equivalents that I mentioned in the first half of the talk with the KLRW algebras. So this T lambda mu's guys are these KLRW algebras. And there we have the functor EI, this usual functors between KLRW algebra modules, um, sort of restriction functors, you would call it getting rid of a black strand. And so this functor, that's the EI functor, the categorification functor, and now uh, we get such a functor which between our galvin settler modules, which does fit into a commutative diagram like this. So that accomplished our goal, which was to define such a functor which would be related to this EIs and um, define it in some more, without, without reference to this equivalence. Now, it's not completely satisfactory because, well, we used all this Coulomb branch <laughs> machinery to do it. And it, if you try to like unpack it and try to reparse what we did in the, in the terms of affine Grassmannians, it, like in terms of affine Grassmannian of the original group GQ, it's quite confusing and, and, and not very geometric. So it's not, and not clear how it can be related to the geometric stack of correspondence. So it's not completely satisfactory, but anyway, it's uh, it's more satisfactory, and that's what we can do. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. There are some questions. Yeah, maybe I have a question. So, uh, what, what about the categorification of the FI operator? Can you can you say something? Well, it's not. Um, yeah, there's a kind of analogous theorem also for the FI operator. I think once once um, once you can do one functor, doing the other one is not so much more difficult. I think like like they won't be by a joint unless you go to category O, but you'll always have the other functor present and, and it can be constructed in, in the same way. I just decided to state it just for, for simplicity, just in terms of FI, but sorry, just in terms of EI, but there also be a FI. So. And is this for uh, non-simplized types uh, as well? Is it uh, or what? Um, I think, I mean, at the moment, I think we can only prove it and we could, yeah, we only try to do it exactly in the simple, in the simply lace case, but I would imagine that it goes through, but I don't have any, uh, yeah, I didn't, we didn't, we didn't study it. I mean, sorry, it's more, it's more maybe symmetric type, not just simply lace, I guess, arbitrary symmetric type. Symmetric. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't say this at the beginning of the talk, but, um, yeah, there was the results. Yeah, the, this result here. We'll go back. Um, this result here in our paper was stated only in the finite type, just for ADE. But I think it. Well, maybe we should wait till the paper is completely finished. But I think in the new paper we'll prove this. Well, we'll also sort of reprove this result or restate it anyway. Um, for arbitrary symmetric Katsumuri. 
but for the for the symmetrizable cats moody i guess it's I, yeah i don't think it appears anywhere at least not yet <laughs> Did you reply to the question of Alan in the chat, the first first question? Or... Uh, maybe not. Yes, but uh, is four a t is four a type A statement or AD or general? But the problem is I lost track of which which it's four. In your first slide with us. Yes, in the first slide. Right, this one here. A bit uh, yeah. Yeah. So the the statement about being a cooler branch. Well. Um, this one here, yeah, the, I mean, if you use the right, first of all, it's certainly true for any ADE type. Um, in any finite type, it's true if you use this version of Coulomb branch, as I mentioned, by Nakajima and Weeks. So then it's true in any finite type case. And, well, I guess it's true even more generally if you, you can... Um, you can just take the Coulomb branch thing as the definition of W lambda mu if you have an arbitrary, if you're not in finite type. Um, but uh, the fact that the Coulomb branch defined that way in affine type, the fact that it agrees with with the what you might define otherwise, that's what's proven, I guess. At least in affine type A by Nakajima and others. So yes, it's 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 basically true always. Whenever whenever the things are defined, it's true. Other question? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, so if you take instead of the usual Coulomb branch of the quiver uh, gauge theory, if you take the Iwahori version of that, uh, what kind of algebra do you get? Um, so when you take the Ohori version, um, you get uh, a Morita equivalent algebra. So these algebras were studied a lot by, by Ben Webster. And in fact, um, it's actually the building block, uh, if we go back to this theorem over here, um, we actually use to, in order, in this theorem here, we actually use the, well, not quite the Ohori version, but a kind of parahoric version of the of this Coulomb branch algebra related to this elk C. So we can form the corresponding parabolic subalgebra of G, and then we can get the corresponding parahoric subalgebra of the loop group. And we use the the parahoric version of the the, the corresponding like the corresponding partial affine flag variety version of these algebras in, in, in this theorem. So those those more complicated algebras um, do play a big role um, in this theorem. But um, what did you mean by what what kind of algebras do you get? I mean, uh... um, I don't know, but I think uh, I have the feeling that uh, uh, the Iwahori version has a better presentation. Yeah. Um, no, they definitely they do have better presentation. And therefore, and and that's used. Uh, yeah. Used yeah. Now. So, so uh, for a different L here. You use different parahoric version. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Exactly. Mm. So that's all. All this uh, induction uh, story, uh, like Hamiltonian Hamiltonian reduction, it also works for all the, for also for the Iwahori version. Or yeah. Not? Yeah. Um, yeah. You could. You could. You could do it. Yeah. You could. Fast. I'll just do the Ohori version and do it there too. Yeah, but somehow, um, um, yeah. So somehow here I've stated it sort of like, well, uh, not with the Ohori version, with the spherical version. And then, and then, if you want to go between these guys, though, you do have to. So e even if you're only interested in the spherical version, like the way I explained in the story in this talk, you will need to use at least the partial affine version partial affine flag variety version related to this elk C in order to relate these guys. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. But I think there is a confusion because uh, when you go to the Iwari case, there is a two version because uh, you can change the only the, uh, the, 
the flag variety, a flag, flag variety, but you, or, or you can also change the fiber, the deal potent part. That's true. And so what you are thinking is essentially yeah. one where you only change the, uh, the flag variety. Yeah. And so it's explained why it is Morita equivalent. Yeah. But it is not probably, uh, so I don't know exactly what uh, Willy had in mind, but I'm not sure it was the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's true. You can, when you, when you, when you pass, like, um, the construction of this Coulomb branch depends on, on sort of, um, well, uh, um, you can, you can choose any, I guess, Iwahori invariant subspace of V tensor K. Probably any Iwahori invariant subspace of V tensor K and, and um, in the definition. So yeah, I have in mind just sticking with just V tensor O. But yeah, there's more complicated algebras that you can make that way. But, uh, I have a question which is uh, different, but uh, <clears throat> so related to this, there is this uh, Ikita conjecture uh, related to Coulomb branch, and uh, which says something about the cohomology of quiver varieties. And uh, when you use uh, this uh, uh, this uh, quantization by uh, by a truncated uh, shifted Youngian, what does it say in the cohomology of quiver varieties? That it gives uh, an explicit presentation or? Uh, you mean if the Hikita conjecture is true? Sorry? Azuringe, I mean Azuringe. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, in fact, this um, this appears in the thesis of Alex Weeks, but I think nowhere else. But there is a, uh, Alex Weeks wrote down such a presentation of the quote homology ring of the quiver variety, um, assuming the Hikita conjecture. Ah, okay. In, uh, so, it's, uh, so now it's all in uh, any type. It's, uh, it's really the point? Um, well, but the, um, so I guess the problem is to write down precisely what the generators, I mean, sorry, what the relations in the, in the, of the ring would be. And I think that Alex just had a kind of conjectural in type A, maybe it, there's a precise statement about what in what the relation should be. And in general, I think it's maybe still conjectural exactly um, how you can use that to write down the relations. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a good question. Maybe we should return to that. Okay.